Morning class. So today we're going to be going over chapter 27, face and neck injuries. So medicine applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation. Based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient, disease, uh, diseases of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, recognition and management of nosebleed, trauma, applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient, head, facial, neck, and spine trauma, recognition and management of life threats, pathophysiology assessment and management of penetrating neck trauma, larynge laryngeotracheal injuries, <clears throat> pathophysiology assessment management of facial fractures, foreign bodies in the eyes, dental drama. Face and neck are vulnerable to injury, relatively unprotected positions on the body. Soft tissue injuries and fractions are common and, and vary in severity. Some injuries are life-threatening. Penetrating trauma to the neck may cause severe bleeding. Open injury may result in an air embolism, uh, especially you have to be worried about the carotid ar arteries um, if the patient has injury there. With appropriate pre-hospital and hospital care, a patient with a seemingly devastating injury can have a surprisingly good outcome. So the head, the cranium, consists of the brain. Most posterior portion is called the occiput. Uh, lateral portions on each side are called temples and or temporal regions. Forward is called the frontal region, anterior to the ear in the temporal region. You could feel the pulse of the superficial temporal artery. The face is composed of eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and cheeks. So six major bones include nasal bone, two zygomas, uh, two maxilla, and a mandible. The only movable bone in the head is going to be the mandible, your jaw. Uh, maxilla is right above your upper lip. Uh, your zygoma is your basically cheekbone, and then you have your nasal bone near your mouth, excuse me, near your nose. The orbit of the eye is composed of lower edge of the frontal bone of the skull. Zygoma, maxilla, nasal bone protects the eye from injury. Only the proximal third of the nose is formed by the bone. The remaining two thirds are composed of cartilage. The exposed portion of the ear is composed entirely of cartilage covered by skin, pina, trachea, trachea, superficial temporal artery. Okay, so you have your C spine right here, your cervical bones. Uh, your temporal man mandibular joint, uh, basically where how your joint pivots, or excuse me, your your jaw pivots, your occiput, uh, your back of your head, and then your ear, your pina. Okay, about one inch posterior to the external opening of the ear is a mastoid process. The mandible forms the jaw and chin. Motion of the mandible occurs at the temporal mandibular joint. Uh, the neck contains many important structures supported by the cervical spine, the upper part of the esophagus, and the trachea lie in the midline of the neck. The carotid arteries are found on either side of the trachea. So the larynx, Adam's apple, is located in the center of the neck. Other portion of the larynx is the cricoid cartilage. Okay, so you have your carotid arteries, one on each side. Uh, then you have your cricoid cartilage right here, and then your crico thyroid membrane and your trachea okay for for men it's a little easier to find uh, because of the Adam's apple and your sternocleidomastoid muscle and you have your thyroid car cartilage right up here so a little bit more in depth uh, picture of the throat uh, which your trachea your cricothyroid membrane cricoid cartilage uh, also your Adam's apple, okay? So the larynx, the cricothyroid membrane lies between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. Soft depression of the midline of the neck. The trachea below the larynx connects the oropharynx and the larynx with the main passages of the lungs. Sternocleidomastoid muscles originate from the mastoid process, allow movement of the head. The eye, globe-shaped, approximately one inch in diameter located within a bony socket in the skull called the orbit. The orbit protects over 80% of the eyeball. And then you got your diagram of the eyeball, anterior and posterior chambers. Okay, 
Your anterior chamber is going to be filled with aqueous humor. So remember A and A. And then posterior compartment is going to be filled with uh, vitreous humor. So the eye, clear like clear jelly-like fluid near the back of the eye is called vitreous humor. In front of the lens is a fluid called the aqueous humor, which can leak out in penetrating injuries. The conjectiva is a membrane that covers the eye. The lacrimal glands produce fluid to keep the eye moist, and they also produce tears when you guys cry. Okay. So here's your nasal lacrimal duct. So normally, when you guys cry, tears are going to be formed right here. <clears throat> the sclera is the white fibrous tissue that helps maintain the globular shape. On the front of the eye, the sclera is replaced by a clear, transparent membrane called the cornea. allows light to enter the eye. The iris is a circular muscle behind the cornea. The pupil is the opening in the center of the iris. allows light to move to the back of the eye. Anosocoria is a condition in which a person is born with different sized pupils. The lens lies behind the iris. Focuses image on the retina at the back of the globe. The retina contains nerve endings. Respond to light by transmitting nerve impulses through the optic nerve to the brain. The retina is nourished by a layer of blood vessels called the chorid. Retinal detachment causes blindness. Injuries of the face and neck can often lead to partial or complete obstruction of the upper airway. Several factors may contribute. Blood clots from heavy facial bleeding, direct injuries to the nose and mouth, larynx and trachea. Dislos dislodgement of teeth or dentures into the throat. Swelling that accompanies direct and indirect injury. Airway may be affected when the patient's head is turned to the side. Uh, possible injuries to the brain or spinal cord. Soft tissue injuries, very common. Uh, face and neck are extremely vascular. Swelling may be more severe. Skin and tissues in these areas have a rich blood supply. A blunt injury can cause a hematoma. So we talked about this before, especially in older people. Small, small traumas or small falls can cause major bleeding and major hematomas. Uh, we have an older patient here. Looks like she fell down and hit her head. Uh, and she's got pretty bad bruising. Uh, she probably had a slip and mechanical fall just by standing up. If you guys slip and have a mechanical fall and hit your head, you guys probably aren't going to bruise that easily. It might not even bleed that much. But since she's older, uh, skin's a little thinner. It's able to um, tear a lot easier and bleed a lot more, especially depending on some medications she might be on. She might be on some blood thinners, uh, which is going to help produce some of this some of this bleeding and uh, contusion ecchymosis over here. So dental injuries, mandible injuries are common. Most of these injuries are a result of vehicle collisions and assaults. Signs of mandible fractures include misalignment of the teeth, numbness of the chin, and inability to open the mouth. Maxillary fractures are usually found after blunt force high energy impacts. Signs of maxillary fractures include Massive facial swelling, instability of the facial bones, misalignment of teeth, fracture and avulsed teeth are common following facial trauma. So this is why we're always opening the uh, the airway, making sure that there's no blood, fluid, or vomitus in the airway. Make sure there's no broken teeth that are going to get loose and patients may aspirate them. And we're also looking in the nose as well. This is why we do a full assessment, especially on trauma patients. Scene size up. Every call, scene safety, observe for hazards and threats, assess for potential violence and environmental hazards. You guys call for PD. PD is not already en route. If you feel unsafe, uh, retreat back to the ambulance. Call for PD. Eye protection and face masks are standards. Uh, carry several pairs of gloves. Determine the number of patients. Ask for more research if you need it. Mechanism of injury, nature of illness. So have a high index of suspicion. For, for trauma patients, uh, kind of guess what you think their injuries might be. Assess the scene. Common MOI for face and neck injuries. Motor vehicle collisions, sports, falls, penetrating trauma, blunt trauma. 
Primary assessment focused on identifying and managing life-threatening concerns. Threats to ABCs must be treated immediately. When there is life-threatening external hemorrhage, it should be addressed before airway and breathing. Form a general impression. Look for important indicators about the seriousness of the patient's condition. Injuries may be very obvious or hidden. Control blood loss with direct pressure. Consider the need for manual spinal stabilization. Check for responsiveness using the AVPU scale. Okay, airway and breathing, sure, clear, and patent airway. If the patient is unresponsive or has significantly altered LOC, consider a properly sized oropharyngeal airway. Remember how to measure OPAs uh, from the corner of the mouth to the corner of the jaw or the corner of the earlobe. Quickly assess for adequacy of breathing. Palpate the chest wall for DCAP BTS. Splinting or otherwise restricting chest wall motion is contraindicated. Circulation. Quickly assess pulse rate and quality. Determine skin condition, color, and temperature. Check capillary refill time. Significant bleeding is immediate life threat. Transport decision. Consider quickly transporting patients with airway or breathing problems or with significant bleeding. Consider ALS backup. Patient with internal bleeding must be transported quickly for treatment by a physician. Signs of hypoperfusion include tachycardia, tachypnea, low blood pressure, weak pulse, cool, moist, pale skin. Even if the patient has no signs of hypoperfusion or other life-threatening injuries, there is a possibility of eye injuries. Patients should be transported as quickly and safely as possible. Surgery will need to be accomplished within 30 minutes or permanent uh, blindness may result. History taking. Investigate the chief complaint. Obtain a medical history. Be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms. Be aware of pertinent negatives. Gather a sample history from the patient or from friends and family. Remember, try and get a, a sample history on everyone if you can. Sometimes it's not possible, and that's okay. But try your best to try and get a sample history from someone on scene if patient is unconscious. Secondary assessment. Remember, everyone's getting a physical. Physical examinations. If multiple systems have been affected. Start with an assessment of the entire body looking for DCAP BTLS. Do not delay transport to, to complete a thorough physical examination. And a responsive patient with an excuse me. <coughs> and a responsive patient with an isolated injury with limited MOI. Consider focusing on the isolated injury, the patient's chief complaint, and the body region affected. Ensure that control of the bleeding is maintained in no in injury location. Inspect the open wound for any foreign matter and stabilize impaled objects. Use both your eyes and your hands. Assess all underlying systems. systems. When evaluating the eyes, start with the outer aspect and work towards the pupils. Examine the eyes for any obvious foreign matter. Visual acuity is a vital sign of the eye. Look for discoloration, bleeding, redness, eye symmetry and pupil size and reaction to light. Brain injury, nerve disease, glaucoma, and meningitis are causes of unequal pupils. Vital signs. Assess vital signs to obtain a baseline. You must be concerned with visible bleeding and unseen bleeding inside a body cavity. With facial and throat injuries, baseline information is very important. Use appropriate monitoring devices. Reassessment. Repeat the primary assessment. Reassess vital signs in the chief complaint. Reassess the patient's condition at least every five minutes. Interventions. Provide complete spinal mobilization if necessary. If you feel the injury uh, warrants C-spine, go ahead and C-spine the patient. If the mechanism is there, remember you're not a doctor. You don't have an x-ray. You want to C-spine somebody if you think the injury calls for it. So always maintain an open airway, be prepared to suction, consider an OPA. Whenever you suspect significant bleeding, provide high flow oxygen. Control significant visible bleeding. If a patient has signs of hypoperfusion, treat aggressively for shock and provide rapid transport. Communication documentation, include a description of the MOI and the position in which you found the patient. Cases of vehicle collision, document the method used to remove the patient from the vehicle. Recognize, estimate, and report the amount of blood loss. Inform the hospital about all injuries involving the head and neck. So emergency medical care. 
treat soft tissue injuries to the face and neck the same as soft tissue injuries elsewhere in the body. Assess ABCs and life threats first. Follow standard precautions. In the absence of life-threatening bleeding, first open and clear the airway. Avoid moving the neck in patients with suspected cervical spinal injuries. So control bleeding by applying direct manual pressure with the dry sterile dressing. Use roller gauze wrapped around the head to hold pressure dressing in place. Do not apply excessive pressure if the underlying skull fracture is present. Cover exposed brain, eye, or other structures with a moist still dressing. Apply ice locally to injuries that do not break the skin. For soft tissue injuries around the mouth, check for bleeding inside the mouth. Broken teeth and tongue lacerations may cause extensive bleeding and obstruction of the upper airway. Physicians can sometimes graft a piece of oval skin back in place, or back in a position. If you find portions of wall skin wrap in a sterile dressing, place in a plastic bag, keep cool, but do not place directly on ice, label and deliver to the emergency department. If an oval skin is still attached in a loose flap, place the flap in position as close to normal as possible, hold in place with a dry sterile dressing. Sorry about that class. Uh, injuries of the eye. Eye injuries are common, particularly in sports, can produce lifelong complications, including blindness. In a normal uninjured eye, the entire circle of the iris is visible. The pupils are round, usually equal in size, and react equally to light. After an injury, pupil reaction or shape and eye movement are disturbed. Treatment starts with a thorough examination. Always use standard precautions. Take care not to aggravate any problems. Look for abnormalities or conditions that may suggest the nature of the injury. Foreign objects. Even a small object may produce severe irritation. Irrigation with a sterile saline solution will frequently flush away loose particles. Use a bulb syringe or nasal airway or cannula. So remember what I said, you guys have to flush out an eye for at least 10 or 15 minutes. You could hook up a nasal cannula uh, to an IV bag, turn it upside down on the bridge of their nose and just let the IV bag flow. And it'll keep flowing for a good 10 minutes or so. <coughs> so foreign objects, airways, flush from the nose side of the eye toward the outside to avoid flushing material into the other eye. So here's your nasal cannula. It's going to be attached to an IV bag. Each prong is going to go into each eye. So when it says flush, flush away to the outside of the eye, to avoid flushing material in the other eye. So if one eye gets exposed, you're not going to turn them to the right side and drain water from from this side going down because you'll get uh, contaminants in the other eye. Then you got two problems. So a foreign body will leave a small abrasion on the conjunctiva. Gentle irrigation may not wash out foreign body stuck to the cornea or line under the upper eyelid. Foreign bodies may be impaled in the eye. Bandage the object in place to support it. Cover the eye with a moist sterile dressing. Surround the object with a donut shaped collar. When you see or suspect an impaled object in the eye, bandage both eyes with soft, bulky dressings to prevent further injury. So if you have something impaled in one eye or an injury to one eye, you're going to bandage the other eye. Um, burns of the eye. Stop the burn and prevent further damage. Chemical burns. Usually caused by acid or alkaline solutions. Flush the eye with water or saline. Direct the greatest amount of irrigating solution or water into the eye as gently as possible. So different things you could do. So you have your nasal cannula, flowing water. You could stick their head under a sink, uh, although it might not be practical um, to hold them there for 15 minutes. Um, you might have to get to the hospital. But if that's your best bet, you do that. You have a a little uh, container of sterile water. You go hold their eye open and just pour it in. Uh, we only carry about four sterile water containers, so you might have to go through all those if you're going to do go that route. Or you could pour sterile water into a bedpan, um, or excuse me, a basin, um, and then kind of dunk the patient's eye. But you can only do that once, because once you put the patient's eye in there, you can contaminate all that water right there. So you can't keep dunking the patient's eye into it. 
That would probably be your last resort right there. So chemical burns, you may have to force the eyelids open. Flush from the inner to outside corner. The burn was caused by an alkali or solution and acid irrigate continuously for at least 20 minutes. After irrigation, apply a clean, dry dressing to cover the eye and transport. Thermal burns. During a fire, the eyes will close to protect from heat and the eyelids will burn. Transport promptly without further examination. <coughs> cover both eyes with a sterile dressing, moisten with sterile saline. Apply eye shields over the dressing. Light burns, infrared rays, eclipse light, and laser beams all can cause significant damage. Retinal injuries caused by exposure to light are generally not painful but may result in permanent damage. Severe conjunctivitis usually develops with redness, swelling, and excessive tears. Lacerations require very careful repair to restore appearance and function. Bleeding may be heavy but it usually can be controlled with gentle manual pressure. There is laceration of the globe itself. Apply no pressure to the eye. Never exert pressure on or manipulate the injured globe. When part of the eyeball is exposed, gently apply a moist sterile dressing to prevent drying. Cover the injured eye with a protective metal eye shield cup or sterile dressing. Apply soft dressing to both eyes and provide prompt transport. On rare occasions, the eyeball may be displaced from its socket. Do not attempt to reposition it. Cover the eye and stabilize it with a moist sterile dressing. Cover both eyes to prevent further injury. Have the patient lie supine. So have the patient lie on their back. It'll be ir easier to irrigate if you put a nasal cannula on them. So blunt trauma, injuries range from the ordinary black eye to a severely damaged globe. Hyphemia obscures all or part of the iris. An orbit fracture is a fracture of the bones that, from the eye, that form the eye floor and support the globe. Retinal detachment is often seen in sports. So eye injuries following head injury. The following findings should alert you to the possibility of a head injury. One pupil larger than the other. Eyes not moving together, failure of the eyes to follow your finger, bleeding under the conjunctiva, protrusion or bulging of one eye. Blast injuries. Signs and symptoms range from severe pain and loss of vision to foreign bodies within the globe. If there is a foreign body within the globe. Do not remove it. If only one eye is injured, follow local protocol. If the patient has severe swelling, do not force the eyelid open to examine it. Contact lenses and artificial eyes. Do not attempt to remove contact lenses unless there is a chemical burn. To remove a hard contact lens, use a small suction cup. To remove soft contact lenses, place one or two drops of saline in the eye. Pinch the lens between your thumb and index finger and lift. <coughs> so, here's how sometimes to remove your different types of contact lenses. Or if possible, see if you could have the patient remove their own contact lenses. That way you don't injure the eye further. Injuries in the nose. Nosebleeds or epistaxis are a common problem. One of the most common causes is digital trauma. Or picking your nose with your finger. Anterior nosebleeds usually originate from the area the septum bleeds slowly. Posterior nosebleeds are usually more severe and often cause blood to drain into the throat. The nose often takes the brunt of physical assaults and car crashes. Blunt injuries may be associated with fractures and soft tissue injuries of the face, head injuries, and or injuries to the cervical spine. Assess the nose structures for injury. It is helpful to picture the, the inside of the nose itself. So here's a picture or di diagram of the nose. Okay. And also when you're looking at the nose, see if it's swollen. See if it looks like it's straight or off to the side. I could probably tell you that the uh, the nose is broken if it's off to the side or if it's swollen. Or even if the patient's crying um, as a result of the, uh, the nose injury. That could also be a sign of a broken nose as well. Cerebral spinal fluid or CSF may escape through the nose following a fracture at the base of the skull. Control bleeding by applying a sterile dressing. 
Injuries of the ear. The ear is complex and associated with hearing imbalance, divided into three parts, external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. So it's a different structures broken down in the ear. You have your outer ear, your pina up here, uh, your hammer, anvil, and stirrup, and your cochlea, uh, middle ear, inner ear. Know your structures too. This might be a test question as well. Ears are often injured, but they do not usually bleed very much. In case of an ear avulsion, wrap the vulse ear in, wrap the vulse part in a moist, sterile dressing and put it in a plastic bag. Tympanic membrane rupture. Sudden changes in pressure created by a blast wave may cause rupture. Patients will report severe ear pain. Difficulty hearing and ringing in the affected ear. Tympanic membrane rupture may be caused by insertion of objects too far into the ear. Transport to the hospital for evaluation. Children place foreign bodies in the external auditory canal. Clear fluid coming from the ear may indicate a skull fracture. <coughs> Facial fractures typically result from blunt impact. Assume a direct blow to the mouth or nose has caused a facial fracture. Other clues in, include bleeding in the mouth, inability to swallow or talk, absent or loose teeth, loose or movable bone fragments. Facial fractures alone are not acute emergencies unless there is a serious bleeding. Plastic surgeries can repair the damage to the face and mouth if the injuries are treated within 7 to 10 days. Swelling can be extreme within the 20, first 24 hours after injury. Usually the doctors will wait till the swelling goes down so it will be a little easier to to do surgery and repair whatever is broken. So dental injuries can be traumatic to the patient. Bleeding will occur whenever a tooth is violently displaced from its socket. Apply direct pressure to stop the bleeding. Perform suction if needed. Cracked or loose teeth are possible airway obstructions. So remember, always open the airway. Always make sure there's no broken teeth. Um, this could be a, a potential airway aspiration issue. Saving transport and involves tooth. Um, dentist might be able to replace the tooth if you still have it. Handle it by the crown rather than the root. Place the tooth in tooth storage solution, cold milk, or sterile saline. Notify the hospital. Reimplantation is recommended within 20 minutes to one hour after the trauma. Remember how to place the tooth in. That might be another test question right there. So injuries of the cheek, you may encounter an object impaled on the patient's cheek. If you are unable to control the bleeding, consider removing the object. Then provide the direct pressure on the inside and outside of the cheek. The amount of bandaging should not occlude the mouth. So always make sure the mouth is clear. Injuries of the neck. The neck contains many structures vulnerable to injury by blunt trauma, upper airway, esophagus, carotid arteries, and jugular veins. Thyroid cartilage, Adam's apple, cricocartilage, upper part of the trachea. Blunt injuries. Any crushing injury of the upper part of the neck is likely to involve the larynx or trachea. Once the cartilages of the upper airway and larynx are fractured, they do not spring back to their normal position. Can lead to loss of voice, difficulty swallowing, severe and sometimes fatal airway obstruction, and leakage of air into soft tissues of the neck. Subcutaneous emphysema is characteristic crackling sensation produced by the presence of air. Complete airway obstruction can develop very rapidly. ALS support either by air or intercept may be necessary. So you may have to call for paramedics or even call for a, a helicopter. Get a critical, critical care nurse on the way. So penetrating injuries can cause profuse bleeding from laceration of the great vessels of, in the neck. Injuries to the carotid and jugular veins can cause the body to bleed out. Exanguation. Um, injuries to these large vessels may also allow air to enter the circulatory system, which can lead to air embolism and cardiac arrest. Direct pressure will control most bleeding. Laryngeal injuries. Blunt force trauma to the larynx can occur when unrestrained driver strikes steering wheel, snowmobile rider strikes a clothesline, the larynx becomes crushed against the cervical spine, resulting in soft tissue injury, fractures, and or separation of the fascia. Penetrating or impaled objects in the larynx should not be removed unless they interfere with CPR. 
Stabilize all impelled objects if they are not obstructing the airway. Remember which, what are the only two times you're going to pull out uh, an impaled object? Signs and symptoms of larynx injuries, respiratory distress, hoarseness, pain, difficulty swallowing, dysphagia, cyanosis, pale skin, sputum in the wound. Or, and subcutaneous emphysema, bruising on the neck, hematoma, bleeding. To manage a laryngeal injury, provide oxygen and ventilation, apply cervical mobilization, but avoid rigid collars. So if you guys carry a soft collar, uh, go ahead and throw that on. So which of the following statements regarding the Adam's apple is false? Remember you guys have that diagram up. Remember where the structures are. So A, the most obvious prominence in the center of the anterior neck is the Adam's apple. The prominence is the upper part of the larynx formed by the thyroid cartilage. It is more prominent in men than in women. The other portion of the larynx is the cricoid cartilage, a firm ridge that is inferior to the thyroid cartilage. The globe of the eye is also called the... So D, the globe of the eye is also called the eyeball. The lens which sits behind the iris focuses images on the retina. The light sensitive area at the back of the globe. The globe is located within a bony socket and the skull called the orbit. Okay, when a person is looking at an object up close that people should So how do the pupils react? when you're looking at an object up close. So B, the pupils which allow light to move to the back of the eye constrict in bright light and dilate in dim light. The pupils should also constrict when looking at an object up close and dilate when looking at an object further away. This is called pupillary accommodation. These pupillary adjustments occur almost instantaneously. So remember how a pupil looks when you guys are checking pupils and how they react to light. What do they do when a light gets shined, it, shined on them up close? <coughs> when caring for a chemical burn to the eye, the EMT should... <laughs> what are a couple things you want to be aware of? What are a couple things you want to do? When you only have one one eye injured. So A, when an irrigating chemical burn to the eye, it is important to direct the stream away from the uninjured eye. If you do not, you will likely flush the chemical into the unaffected eye. After irrigating the eye for the appropriate amount of time, cover both eyes with a sterile dressing. Which of the following signs is least indicative of a head injury? Remember, we just talked about this. Question three, what, is it, what do the pupils do when a light is uh, shined directly on it? B, the pupils normally constrict in bright light and dilate in dim light. Suspect a head injury if the pupils do not react appropriately, are asymmetrical or unequal, do not move together, the patient is unable to look upward. So the purpose of the Eustachian tube is to So C, the middle ear is connected to the nasal cavity by the Eustachian tube, which permits equalization of pressure in the middle ear when external atmospheric pressure changes. When caring for a patient with facial trauma, the EMT should be most concerned with Remember, go by your assessment. What comes first? 
So B, no airway, no patient. Injuries to the face often cause obstruction of the upper airway, either by clotted blood or associated swelling. Additionally, large amounts of blood can be swallowed, which increases the risk of vomiting and aspiration. Bleeding control, spinal trauma, and associated injuries are important factors and should be treated accordingly. However, the airway comes first. So the presence of subcutaneous emphysema following trauma to the face and throat is most suggestive of what? So C, crushing injuries or fractures of the larynx or trachea can result in a leakage of the air into the soft tissues of the neck. The presence of air in the soft tissues produces a characteristic crackling sensation called subcutaneous emphysema. A 21-year-old male has a large laceration to his neck. When you assess him, you note that bright red blood is spurting from the left side of his neck. You should immediately... First off, what kind of bleeding is this? There are three different types of bleeding, remember? Capillary, venous, and arterial. Blood is spurting. It's probably going to be an arterial bleed. So a patient's probably going probably gonna to die pretty quickly if you guys don't take care of that arterial bleed. So C, laceration of the card artery is evidenced by bright red blood spurting from the wound can cause profuse bleeding, profound shock, and death very quickly. You must immediately control the bleeding with the use of direct pressure. Cover the wound with your glove hand initially and then apply a bulky pressure dressing. After the bleeding has been controlled, apply high flow oxygen and transport promptly. So which of the following mechanism of injury would most likely cause a crushing injury of the larynx and or trachea? So A, any crushing injury of the upper part of the neck is likely to involve larynx or trachea. Examples include the anterior neck impacting a steering wheel, hanging distraction mechanisms, and clothesline injuries. 